Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Alex. Thank you, panelists. Our second expert panel will discuss eugenics, screening, and contemporary sequencing technologies. Panelists include Radith Ravitsky, University of Montreal, Alexander Mina Stern, University of Michigan, Joy Boyer, NHGRI, and Lori Irby. Over, your, over to you, Kamisha. Thank you. So hi everyone and welcome to our second panel. Um, before I turn things over to the panelists, I wanted to provide some conceptual framework from the last panel to guide our considerations. So I assume a little bit here that we may have uh, gained some new members uh, in, in, the, in the audience as well. Um, so in particular, I want to frame the historical and contemporary relationship between eugenics, race and disability. And I think that also kind of came up in the, the Q&A um, last, last panel as well. So I want to mention, as I did in the previous panel, two different ways to understand the term eugenics. One is to see it as a primarily historical phenomenon that is defined by the means it used to pursue its goals of promoting the so-called genetically fit and eliminating the so-called genetically unfit. At its most extreme, eugenics was carried out through genocide, but it also sought to control which people and groups were worthy of reproducing and tried to prevent uh, dysgenic reproduction through forced sterilizations, while also promoting the reproduction of people thought to be fit. So because discourses of racial hygiene, racial degeneration, and social Darwinism were very popular at the time, it's become common to think that a particular largely discredited view of race was the cause of historical eugenics and the key feature that made it morally abhorrent. But there is another way to understand eugenics, simply as the idea that social problems have both a biological basis and to some degree a potential biological remedy. Thus, there are bioethicists today that support the idea of liberal eugenics, which they see as a scientific and technological project aimed at human betterment through selection, which works by taking measures to ensure that the humans who do come into existence will be capable of enjoying better lives and of continuing contributing to the betterment of the lives of others. In this liberal eugenics, race as a concept is largely absent. It is not racial group membership of parents that determines whether a potential child is selected to come into existence. Instead, it, it is facts about that child's genome. And here, as our panelists will discuss, a different social group is targeted for elimination or reproduct, re reduction, that is people with disabilities. So what you'll hear about a lot in this panel is the disability critique of genetic screening and sequencing technologies and practices of genetic counseling. This could lead to the impression that whether we label both as eugenics or not, we're talking about very different things uh, at the beginning of this century as compared to the beginning of the last century. But so what I want to suggest by contrast is the idea that what old and new eugenics have in common and what is actually a major problem is that they both exist in a shared and dominant epistemic space centered around the idea of and obsession with heredity. By epistemic space, I mean a broadly shared way of knowing and making sense of the world that's so pervasive that it often goes unnoticed or uninterrogated. As Troy Duster puts it, we have come to see the world through a prism of heritability. This epistemic space, I would argue, is also the home of the race idea and of scientific racism. So eugenicists past and present, and by other names, those who disavow the use of the term eugenics, share with each other and with race scientists and with animal breeders, a particular modern sensibility that views the natural world and human reproduction as always ripe for intervention in the name of industry efficiency, productivity, and ultimately perfectibility. In this context and today, eugenicists emerge as those believers in the power of science and technology who perceive clear and present dangers to humanity on the horizon and are thus driven to convince others that taking control of human nature, mental and physical, is an invaluable social good necessary to ensure human survival. So again, um, we see disability, race, and eugenics all existing in that space about the importance of heritability and the desire to uh, take control of that uh, for the sort of general good. Um, all right, so that's, uh, that's my framing. And now let's go to uh, our first panelist, who will be Lori Erby. Uh, 
Thank you. And I, I think I, this was a, a, is a nice um, move from the beginning part of the panel into the second panel, I think thinking from history into the present day. Um, it's been such an engaging topic and it's a challenging one. Um, and I'm happy to be here to kind of help us think it through. Um, so I'm a genetic counselor. I spend currently most of my time in genetic counseling research and training. Um, I do want to provide one brief update to my bio because although it's not why I was invited, it, it's an important part of my story that influences my own thinking as related to these topics that we've been discussing today. It was that I am an older sibling to an individual with intellectual and physical disability due to a non-inherited chromosome deletion. And that has been a, you know, a part of my life and a part of the pers pers perspective I've brought to the field of genetic counseling. So in my remarks, I wanna provide some context around the contemporary genetic counseling definition, how we practice, how we train genetic counselors, how that is implemented specifically in reproductive genetic counseling, um, but how and how the field has been grappling with the challenging issues that we're discussing with regard to um, non-invasive prenatal screening, newborn potential of newborn screening, and other emerging technologies, um, which can provide access to what people might see as life-changing information, but as but also has implications for families making future reproductive decisions for themselves, for future generations, and for others in society. Um, and genetic counselors, I think, are discussed often as being on the front lines of all of these initial conversations when people are being introduced to all the various technologies. And that is true, um, has been true, but it, I think, is important for us to think about the context in which, as these become much more universally accepted, um, that will be less true, that genetic counselors will often be on the back end dealing with people who've, who've recently gotten diagnoses but likely won't be the, the primary people initially discussing the offer of these screening tests, those will that'll happen likely in primary care and in obstetricians offices. And so some of the things that people were talking about in the Q&A um, that maybe we didn't get to yet last panel around making sure that we're also thinking beyond genetic counselors to other healthcare providers as we think about this conversation is really important. Um, and I do think genetic counselors will continue to um, be in a position to frame policy and to create structures that support informed decisions and also thinking about what that means both on an individual level and a, a broader societal level. So our contemporary definition of genetic counseling does include language around promoting informed choice, which has that very individual level notion that we've been talking a lot about and also adaptation to the risk or to the condition or to whatever it is that we're finding in the genome. Um, and that adaptation piece is really central to how we think about ourselves now and to training. Um, and, and we spend a lot of time working with families um, who have been identified as having genetic difference and thinking about how does that affect your life? How do you begin to live um, with that? How do you ex appreciate the quality of your life? Um, and so genetic counselors are often embedded in those kinds of conversations at the same time also being asked to be embedded in conversations around, well, what does this mean in terms of my decisions for the next generation and what I want to do? Um, and in decisions about broader societal population screening. Um, I think Dr. Sturm mentioned in the last panel this term non-directiveness, which has been part of our ethos from fairly early on. Um, and that term, you know, I think does demonstrate the commitment of the field to wanting to help people make individual level choices. The term itself has been debated, I think, because it does imply maybe a more passive stance. Um, and I prefer now the term that my colleague Layla Jamal has been included in her recent writing, which is more autonomy enhancement, which allows for the recognition that the information we choose to impart and how we choose to present that does have an influence on how people think about these decisions and that we need to do our work in a way that maximizes clients' ability to make decisions that are consistent with their own values and based on relevant information. Genetic counseling training does include attention to competencies related to communication and counseling skills, as well as awareness of personal biases and how those might influence counseling. But I would note that there's a need for additional research to identify which methods accomplish this most effectively. And also in practice, I, I want to express some humility that, there, that there's a space for explore, the exploration of the interplay of the personal, the familial, and the social. And that if we think about that individual space with a client um, as being even, even in a one hour space, if we have the luxury of having one hour, it's challenging at best to really dive into that exploration in a way that starts to really ask people to think about the social norms in which they've grown up and which society is pushing them towards. So I wouldn't say that we shouldn't be doing that work, but I'm saying we don't necessarily always have good models for thinking about how do you in a short space really help to begin to disentangle some of the messaging that people are getting outside of the context of genetic counseling. Um, I will close by noting that this is an ongoing conversation in our own field as we grapple with all the things we've been talking about this afternoon. Our accreditation standards as training programs require um, 
require us to have disability education for our trainees, but each program addresses this in different ways. As was mentioned earlier, there are some programs that really have created models for education, others that are doing less. And I think there is room for all of us to think about what would be most effective. And I think there's also room to think about beyond training. So once a student leaves, we're all trained as generalists. We do that work with individuals and families where we get to know the families in their own context, and then also do the reproductive genetic counseling work. But when we leave graduate training and we go on to work in the field, most people who currently work in reproductive spaces, according to our most recent professional status survey, people who are working in those spaces actually spend most of their time only working in reproductive spaces and so don't have ongoing opportunities to, to talk with families and to meet with families who are living with genetic difference. And so I think there's room for us and it's imperative that we think about how do we continue exposure um, to that aspect of our life and our work and our advocacy so that the people who are, who are charged with helping people make reproductive decisions don't become, um, and don't get so siloed that they're not really appreciating the broader perspectives of the community. So this, this idea of community engagement and stakeholder engagement that's come up several times, I think is really critical to our field. Um, so I will just end by saying that there is a recognition in our field that individual choices exist within or influenced by and also influence the societal norms and pressures. Um, and genetic counselors do have a history of advocacy for individual clients, but we also need to stay actively um, engaged to advance the sorts of societal change that can support and celebrate genetic difference. So I'll end there. Thank you. And um, we can welcome our next panelist, um, Vardit Ravitsky. Thank you. I would like to continue um, with what Lori started and stay in the prenatal context. A lot of the questions in the Q&A have uh, focused on that. And with all the technologies we have available today from the screening of in vitro embryos, even for common diseases, which is upcoming with uh, polygenic risk scores, and obviously screening fetuses during pregnancy, some have said that we are in the process of creating a standard or a threshold of entry into society. So you have to meet a certain standard to join the human race. And of course, that that is so reminiscent of eugenic uh, uh, ideas that it justifies our conversation today. Um, so to, to continue with uh, the way Lori described genetic counseling in the prenatal context, um, we have been telling ourselves and patients and the funders of genomics research that prenatal testing is not eugenic because it's about providing information to enhance choice, famous reproductive autonomy. So uh, first of all, people should not be pressured to use these services. Um, and yet, if you knew how many people ask me, is prenatal testing obligatory? Why are they asking, is it obligatory? Uh, when it's supposed to be so obviously offered as a choice, because it's integrated into pregnancy care in a way that seems um, that it seems irresponsible to reject it. And that's a part of the societal message that sort of surrounds this technology. How hard we have to work to ensure everybody knows they have the choice not to even engage in this testing process. Um, and for those who choose to test, to screen, um, how hard do we have to work to make sure that it's not seen as what some clinicians have called a search and destroy mission? It's not about a one way route towards termination. People may want to know to prepare for the birth of a child who might have special needs, need special supports. They may want to consider adoption or they may want to consider termination, but they have multiple options. And then in order to ensure that, you know, counseling, the provision of healthcare does not uh, engage in unigenic practices. As Lori said, we have to make sure it's value neutral, provides balanced information and famously non-directive because you're supposed to make your own informed and free choice. So I wanna say two words about free and two words about informed. When we talk about informed and we want to provide balanced information, what does that mean? Is it a balance between medical information that highlights the problems your child might have versus lived experience information, families sharing how happy they are with uh, raising their children who may have medical issues or a disability? What is the right balance there between medical and lived experience 
or within each of those categories. And again, emphasis on the terminology that we use. Clinicians talk to pregnant people and to families about high risk results. The word risk obviously has negative connotations, but our entire clinical world uses it, while the disability world would like to us to use the term chance. You have a high chance of this versus that. But there's still this uh, disconnect between the terminology that clinicians are used to using and genetic counselor and disability advocates are trying to introduce. Uh, do we talk about normal fetuses versus abnormal? We now know that the term normal should not be used. It conveys way too much societal and value uh, uh, connotations. Um, but what should we use, an affected fetus versus a typical fetus? In genetics, we used to talk about defective genes. <laughs> of course, we do not ever want to talk about defective human beings. So what do we use? A mutation, an extra chromosome, or genetic difference, as Laurie tried to teach us. But you can see wh wherever you look, there are critically important terminological choices to be made. And we are not educated enough as professionals to make these choices uh, responsibly and to consider all the implications, uh, all the messages that are conveyed when we use the wrong term or an insensitive term. That's about informed. Now about free. We talk about individual choices. But what about those immense cultural and socioeconomic pressures surrounding our families? Um, a lot of people tell us, I would welcome a child with trisomy 21 into my family happily, but I don't have the societal support. What about school? What about, you know, having a job later in life? My child will not be able to live alone. What happens when I become old and I cannot care for my child? Will his siblings have to take care? So the societal, you know, it takes a village uh, policy decisions about uh, the resources that we need to dedicate as a society. To, to, to support families who make these choices. If we don't create those supports, the decision is not free, even if you received your famously balanced information. So it's not an individual choice. It's made in a wider context. And finally, last point, how does all this complexity play out when we consider the distinction between disability and disease? In the context of screening for disease, we think that genomics is about preventing suffering, uh, improving well-being. Um, so what is the message to a family uh, screening a fetus with a devastating disease such as Tay-Sachs versus a disability that is not a disease such as trisomy 21? And what about types of disease? How do we de define a serious disease versus you know, a mild? Do we even have the terminology again to talk about that? What about a disease where we only genetics only gives us a risk, not a certainty? when it's late onset and we will have decades of healthy life before we get sick. So the, the complexity of uh, sort of uh, disentangling the conceptual mess of disability, disease, serious, not serious, um, treatable, not treatable, at what cost, uh, we are, uh, genetic counselors are operating in such a complex um, uh, landscape uh, that um, it's almost impossible to do everything right um, in, in the context of conceptual challenges and societal challenges. So I'm sorry that this is not a more positive note, but I just wanted to sort of paint the, this complex and challenging landscape to feed into our conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And our next panelist uh, will be Joy Boyer. Hi, uh, it is such a pleasure to, to speak with this group today and, um, and an honor to, to be on a panel with um, Vardit, Kamisha, Lori, and Alex. Um, I wanted to build on Vardit's point about the need to really pay attention to the language we use and the social and cultural factors and the power relationships that impact um, genomics, both its implementation in reproductive settings and also in the design and implementation of the research itself. Um, it's worth noting that the Human Genome Project, which mapped and sequenced the human genome, like most large techno technological efforts, was ultimately a product of a really complex interaction between scientific, social, cultural, and political forces. Um, but unlike earlier uh, large science project, projects, 
and to the surprise, and I got to say at times consternation of some of the scientific community. When the Genome Project was ultimately funded by the US Congress, it specifically included a program that was tasked to anticipate and address the implications of the science for um, individuals, communities, and society more broadly. This program, which you re you've heard referred to as LC, and that's not LC, it's ELSI, um, for the Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications of Genomics, was written into the original funding legislation. And it has um, something that's somewhat extraordinary, which is a congressional mandate to receive 5% of every dollar that's spent on the Human Genome Project would go to support projects um, that are examining many of the issues that have been raised today. The legacy of eugenics and the ongoing fraught relationships between genomics and reproduction and concepts of disability have been an ongoing focus for LC research. Um, from early projects on eugenics by historians Bill Schneider and Howard Markle to Joan Rothschild's uh, decade spanning research that culminated in the book, The Dream of the Perfect Child. It's included seminal work by Eric Perens and Adrian Ash, a disabilities activist on prenatal testing and disability rights. And more recently, work by panic, uh, panelist Alex Stern on forced sterilization, as well as a number of projects that are looking at the impact of non-invasive um, prenatal genetic testing and IPT on health and reproductive decisions, particularly in marginalized communities. Obviously, there remains much to be done, um, both in acknowledging the past abuses like eugenics and in identifying and illuminating um, the social and cultural factors that provided a fertile ground for those abuses. Um, and how they continue to play a role in um, how genomics is used today, um, particularly as it's used in reproductive settings. Um, and I'm happy to, to provide more information on the LC research program, um, but I think that I will leave it at there and um, turn it over to Alex for the closing panel remarks. Thank you so much. Nice to see you all again. Um, I just want to follow up on the astute comments of my colleagues by adding uh, two thoughts. The first is uh, the provocation that I think it's really time for us to retire the term pseudoscience. It's been around for a long time. It's played a role in serving as a divider between the ugliness of the past and ostensibly the enlightened views of the present, but it is not doing any good work for us. Um, at this point anymore, especially if we really are committed to tracing the continuities with respect to ableism and scientific racism that everyone on this panel is committed to. So let's retire that word and let's figure out what our new language would be. And I very much appreciate uh, Lori's attention to language and thinking about autonomy enhancement in the context of non-directiveness, which leads to my second point in thinking, I've thought a lot about non-directiveness, its historical evolution. And on, to some extent, it has served as kind of a cop-out, let's say, because at, you know, in, in the most cynical sense, you could say that genetic counselors would point to non-directiveness and say, well, I'm being non-directive, I'm being neutral, I'm being objective, I'm just sharing the facts. It is the product of a certain time and place, namely the 70s, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, when most genetic counseling was in the reproductive and pediatric domain. Yet things changed by the 90s and into the 21st century with the rise of new types of genetic screening and testing for, for example, BRCA1 and 2, um, different forms of cancer, in which you know, probabilities or the existence of a genetic marker for such conditions actually raise questions, is it ethical to be non-directive in a situation like that, where a certain health intervention might be um, the most, um, the most, the best course of action. In other words, 
you know, uh, to be a previvor of breast cancer by pursuing a mastectomy or other types of interventions. So that's another way in which this whole issue of non-directiveness is complicated by the development of the technologies themselves, um, which is always a moving target, so to speak, in the context of medical genetics, because often the policies, the approaches, the regulatory um, attempts, if they exist, are kind of often left behind in the dust as the technologies themselves continue to develop. So I will stop there and um, let Kamisha lead us on. Great, thank you so much. And we have a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting questions in the chat. Um, so, um, so let's start um, with this one. Um, how can genetics professionals help reconcile the need to protect, protect reproductive freedoms with the need to advocate for vulnerable populations? I'm thinking specifically of state bans on abortion based on genetic prenatal test findings. So how, you know, so how do we um, offer choices to people and full information when, um, when we have these other uh, timeline restrictions for people on, on what they can or can't do about a pregnancy that are likely to become uh, more common. Well, isn't that the $50 million question? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think this is a real challenge and I'm afraid I'm not going to offer great solutions, but I think it feels very poignant particularly in this particular time. And I know my colleagues who work in reproductive genetics in particular are really actively grappling with, with what, what does it mean to be attempting to offer opportunities for personal engagement with your, your with genetic risk or genetic chance or genetic difference um, in, in a space where there may not be much, you may not have many options in terms of acting on that information. Um, and I think, it, I don't have good responses other than I think you can still tell people, um, I think the goal is to still help people understand um, and to begin to think about how they move forward given the societal context in which they live. And again, sort of leaning into at some level that adaptation response of like, what do we do to help, help this individual client in this moment given what their personal constraints are. At the same time, I think we have a professional obligation to be continuing to work towards societal change, which I sort of ended with at the end of my, so there's what can you do in this moment with this client, but what do we do as a profession to try to create spaces both to celebrate difference and to make room for difference and to make room for options so that people can, um, can, can build the lives that they want for their children and their families. Um, Kamisha, I want to use this opportunity to point out that we cannot burden individuals, whether they're genetic counselors or prospective parents, with solving problems that we create at the systemic level as a society because of policies that do not support autonomy while we are constantly telling people that everything we're doing is about autonomy. So if, <laughs> if uh, the legal uh, context changes and uh, pregnancy termination becomes uh, so limited that genetic counseling happens at the wrong time, genetic counselors cannot be expected to solve that problem, just like individual families cannot be expected to be responsible with their individual choices for either enhancing genetic diversity in society or eliminating all forms of human suffering. Uh, so when I look today at what it means to be pregnant with all these technologies that are offered or sometimes you feel pushed upon you, it became almost impossible to do things right. So uh, as a pregnant person, it's almost like you will be blamed for something. If you reject testing or you do not act on results, you're already an irresponsible parent before you even had a baby. If you act upon it, you're not respectful, respectful of diversity and why won't you welcome a child with special needs? It's almost like the, the technology is cornering you as an individual decision maker uh, so that no matter what you do, uh, you're socially not respecting some values. Um, and again, this is so, uh, uh, so dramatically um, the other extreme then what we said we were doing with all of this technology, which is to enhance choice, to give information in order to promote autonomy. Uh, so we, we, we started on a journey to promote autonomy and we ended up trapping people uh, from both directions. 
So I'm, this is just a desperate call to stop blaming individuals, whether professionals or patients, for systemic issues that we created ourselves. I'll, I'll be charitable to the question uh, asker and say that I think the question was more about what, how challenging is it to balance these sort of things as you're doing your work, rather than a sense that you have a particular duty to uh, solve a uh, solve a problem that's that's not of your own making. But you know, how does that how does that make your life more complicated as a genetic counselor? Um, I, I think if we're, if we're charitable to the question asker. Um, th were there any other people who wanted to respond to that one? Um, so, so trying to, um, so there's a lot of questions <laughs> about the kinds of stuff that Vardy just mentioned in terms of like big social problems. Um, so I'll try to find a few that, um, that take it down a little bit. Um, so uh, what is the current training for genetic counselors for how they're talking with patients when it comes to genetic literacy and the history of communities, especially those who have untrustful experiences with practitioners? Yeah, and I can speak at a broad level and then a, a sort of a more micro level because it's the micro level that I know the best. So as I mentioned briefly in my comments originally, there are broad standards that say that genetic counseling programs have to address this on a, on a, a base. You know, we have to teach students self-awareness. We have to help them rec recognize their own biases. We have to teach them some of the history of the disability, the eugenics and disability, and we have to give them exposure. We have to teach them counseling and communication skills to begin to work with a patient, a client on their own individual level. Um, but every program does this very differently. So I can speak a little bit to how, how we do that. So we, we, um, we have a very strong emphasis in our own program on starting from the patient, starting from the patient's perspective. And we spend a lot of time emphasizing counseling skills, really like, how do you begin? How do you ask those probing questions to understand where your client is coming from and to build your information and your, and, and I think as Be Becca mentioned earlier in the panel, using language that mirrors the language that they're using and recognizes the experiences they come in with. Um, and we have, we have classes on Sort of helping think about how you communicate at a level that is understandable to everyone but then to tailor that to where people need to go and what information needs to happen we also have courses that are uh, that in, in embedded and integrated throughout some of our introductory courses we talk about the history of our profession and and ableism and disability so that is beginning to be integrated throughout um, so that's our approach we also have um, we have our students do weekly one-on-one -on -one supervision where they are really asked and challenged to like, let's listen to what you said with this client on this recording and let's challenge how you approached it and how the client took that in and think about how you could have done that differently. Um, that really helps them grow those skills and that happens throughout. So there's constant, there's that sort of constant one-on-one -on -one supervision um, and rethinking. Great, thank you. Um, so trying to, trying to manage many a question here. Um, so I guess um, one that, uh, <laughs> again, takes things maybe uh, away from your uh, individual practices as genetic counselors. Um, but there was a question about, uh, there's actually a, a couple of questions around um, this idea, but here's, here's one. Um, newborn screening authorization bill in Congress is, is in Congress uh, per, uh, currently. It includes provisions that allow the storage and unrestricted use uh, because of repeal of human subjects, uh, re research designations on samples taken from newborns. So this person's interested to know the panelists' thoughts on the bill and ideas about how current federal laws could allow or disallow the misuse of mass collection of every newborn in America. Oh, and I should say, I, I would connect this to an earlier question as well um, that was pointing to histories of, um, of data collection on various populations, um, you know, indigenous populations, non-white populations, and, and the, the sort of um, misuses of, of that data and, and the sort of um, profit that is made scientifically uh, and for researchers on that sort of data. So do you, do you all have this concern about how this individual, this sort of practice that, that people are, are choosing individually generates this kind of um, database of information and how that might be used. 
So I am not a policy expert, so maybe others can also weigh in, but I can say that, that I, mean, this, I think this question really well captures this tension between the need for scientific data, to, if we're try, talking about equitable um, g genomic information, we need scientific information that captures, um, captures conditions across, across our society, across populations, and so that requires broad-based participation, which as we all know as researchers is very difficult to get. At the same time, when you remove the consent model and you're, you have blanket um, introduction of, of everybody just automatically in, that, um, that raises lots of concerns around trust um, with particularly marginalized communities that have historically been um, not well treated in the research world. And so I, I, I think this is, it's a complicated, it's a very complicated and a very good and astute question. Um, it's clear that the, there's, a, the, there's a tension here between public health benefit, especially when we realize that medical research and genomics research in the future will depend on enormous databases and uh, research methodologies that depend on machine learning and artificial intelligence. We're moving into that era and we will need uh, enormous amounts of data in order to do this well. And this research will benefit definitely uh, thousands and, and hundreds of thousands of patients. So you have all this benefit on one hand and then uh, enormous risks to trust and to privacy on the, on the other. Um, policy making is, is an intricate uh, dance of balancing these, these risks, but we have to remember that, you know, we're genetically unique. And when you start uh, crossing different types of medical information, it's not going to be difficult to identify individuals even if samples are anonymized, uh, there are real risks here to privacy uh, throughout the life of all those individuals where samples are, are stored. Um, now, I, I just want to use this opportunity to add another layer to this concern about privacy, um, because what about all those fetuses that have had NIPT and were carried to term? What if we start doing whole genome sequencing through NIPT during pregnancy and babies are just born with their entire, uh, what I call, genome exposed, even though we're trying not to test minors uh, unless there's a clear medical need during childhood. What about embryos that have been uh, screened and then implanted and then carried to term? So I think a lot of babies will be born with a lot known about them already in the coming years. You add newborn screening to that and the whole notion of you know, the right to an open future, my right to decide uh, whether to test, what to test when I become an adult. We may be seeing all of that, uh, you know, become a thing of the past and have to come to terms with the fact that we walk around uh, with our, again, genomes exposed without us ever having consented to that. Uh, how do we manage all of that at a policy level? That, that's the big challenge of the future. And I'll add to that because I think it's such an important point. Not only do we have to think about the privacy implications and the, the risk to the, or not just risk, the, the idea of the, the, the um, disappearance of the open future because it is it just, it just it will become something that we all potentially just know. Um, I think there's also the potential, since that, all, that information may um, be derived at the beginning of one's life, we need structures to help make sure that at the very least there's benefit to the individual um, and where it's sort of time appropriate across development. And we don't currently have those structures to make sure that information that was gained when you were in utero is now relevant to you when you're 30, but that you actually still have access to that. And absolutely, if we're going to have that world, we need to build structures that make the benefit at least realistic to people. And those don't exist right now. I'll just add as the historian in the group that of course there is this, you know, unpleasant backdrop of the misuse and the harm done to a range of different communities. Although it wasn't primarily a genetics study, you know, we know about the Tuskegee syphilis study and, you know, the early history of the human genome project in itself was embroiled with native communities that, you know, felt that the um, collection methods themselves were a kind of colonial piracy. And um, uh, folks have written about this in and, and very poignant ways. And I know that many course corrections have been done and there's much more awareness. Nonetheless, you know, I still think that that hasn't completely, 
gone away and that's why we need to the stakeholders are so important engaging the different communities are important but also on their terms and what it means to them because all too often um you know the kind of biomedical or expert viewpoint is solidified in one way that doesn't allow for the kind of input communication and trust that would be needed and i know there are many folks working on this and there was a comment in the in the q a about the work that alondra nelson is doing around an ai bill of rights and you know that obviously would intersect with exactly what your Vardit was talking about in terms of the exposed genome especially once those are turned into algorithmic probabilities, et cetera, et cetera. We already live in that world. Yeah, and I would I would add to that um, the importance of trust, as Lori brought it up. And you know, a foundation of trust is acknowledging past abuses. And and I think that's part of what we're doing today. Um, but I think genomics as a community needs to be much more aware of those past abuses and how that is being carried forward in some ways, inadvertently. But I think it's very important that we're always conscious of, of those factors and the impact that that's had, particularly on um, communities who have been misused or marginalized in the past. Thank you all for that. Um, so um, I think there's, uh, there's two questions that I can kind of uh, put together. Um, the first was, um, how can the research community listen to the Down syndrome's community community's request to not be screened out of existence? Um, and then uh, another question um, that, uh, that uh, and now I've lost, uh, says that, um, as it stands, uh, the pervasiveness of um, NIPT will slowly but surely lead to screening particular kinds of people out of existence. I mean, again, this, I guess, suppose depends on whether this really spreads across the world or not. Um, but um, but uh, so, so, uh, na so namely those with intellectual disabilities, uh, they say see Iceland. So some bioethicists are willing to allow that to happen since it would be the result of many individual choices rather than government, po government policy. Can the panelists discuss whether that distinction is morally relevant? So, so, all, so, so two questions sort of centering around this idea of, of screening out of existence and, um, and how we should think about this action as, as committed through individual choices. Um, I'll start because we just published a paper about the global emergence of NIPT, which is already available in over 60 countries. It's going to be a multi-billion, it's already a multi-billion dollar market globally. Um, so that horse is left. It is all over the world and it's being used uh, mostly privately which of course exacerbates gaps in terms of uh, access to this information. And then it is also implemented in countries that have various types of abortion legislation, uh, which means that in some cases it promotes uh, you know, unsafe illegal access to abortion, uh, not to mention sex, non-medical sex selection in other countries. So the global implementation of NIPT raises many issues, some of them related to eugenics and, and some to others. Um, when uh, what, the person that asked said, uh, bioethicists are willing to allow it. Bioethics, uh, just like genetic counseling, just like the entire enterprise of genetic and genomics research, has been about promoting well being and enhancing autonomy. So uh, we're going back to the point that uh, having a societal impact by banning options for individuals or by pushing individuals towards certain uh, choices uh, is not uh, in line with the ethos of either genomics or bioethics. Uh, so I think the answer to the issues of uh, supporting marginalized communities, supporting, uh, enhancing equity, um, allowing a society that is truly respectful of diversity and tolerant of any choice that families uh, uh, would like to make based on their own cultural, religious, personal values. That kind of world that we want to see cannot rest on the shoulders of individuals who now have to make certain choices in order to make that world possible. 
Uh, this responsibility rests on uh, the social sh uh, shoulders of policy that creates a space, a social space that allows any choice, that gives the resources for any choice. Uh, so, you know, as individuals, we can be political activists. We can put pressure on our governments to dedicate resources to supporting children and families and creating access to safe and legal abortion for those who need it. We can be activists to, uh, to, to influence policy, but the solution to these problems has to be at a policy level and cannot be uh, carried by families one by one or by professionals one by one. I, I made that point before, but I really think this is the critical uh, point here in terms of making autonomy uh, real and not just lip service to uh, an entire industry and an entire uh, enterprise that it that could be fundamentally uh, that could become fundamentally eugenic. Yeah, and I'll just I'll reiterate that I think that because that point can't be made enough that I think the social structure is really key here. We can ensure that genetic counseling, whether that's being provided by genetic counselors or others, is being done in such a way that it really does allow individuals opportunity to understand the possibilities of quality of life, to understand the ways in which having a child with Down syndrome or any other um, potential thing that we might be screening for um, can still fit within the values, within your picture of a family. But that rests on the, the, the idea that society will support that, that there are resources available to make that lived future possible. Um, and so both things, certainly we have the ability to change what happens in an individual level practice so that there are there is the space to allow that to happen, but the social structure needs to exist to support that. Any other thoughts there? Um, okay. Um, Let's see. Well, another question um, was about, or another pair of questions maybe, um, was about um, what we do with um, polygenic um, traits where there are both risks and protective functions. Um, uh, and and you know, examples were given of um, uh, CL or sickle cell in, uh, in relation to the protection against diseases like cholera and malaria. Uh, Kamisha, are you asking in the context of testing adults, testing embryos? Uh, yeah, yes, it's, sorry, there, it is in the context of prenatal testing or um, embryo testing. Yeah, because, because wondering if we, by, it, by selecting against polygenic traits that also have protective functions, uh, whether that will, will do damage um, in, in some kind of larger sense. So I just promise you, if there were questions just about ca genetic counseling, I would be giving them to you. You can also ask each other questions. And um, I saw the the questions in the Q and A about uh, polygenic risk score uh, uh, screening of embryos, and it's important to point out that at this point in time, uh, the bioethics community and the clinical community are speaking in one voice that it is scientifically premature and therefore ethically irresponsible to offer this to prospective parents. We don't know enough. It's not ready for implementation. Uh, and the benefits do not outweigh the risks. Uh, so that's a simple uh, answer for once. <laughs> we have an answer regarding the em embryo context. For adults, uh, a very different uh, situation because people can make their choice, their own individual choices. And uh, I'd love to, to hear what Lori has to say about how genetic counselors cope with this right now. But obviously, the more the genetic information is complex and the more knowing carries risks and benefits, the more careful we have to be about offering a service. And when it's offered to patients, we have to be sure we're not doing more harm than good, as always, as in any other medical intervention. And I think that the general sense is that this is not ready for prime time. Yeah, and I think the place where this is happening clinically now is largely in the cancer space um, for adults, sort of thinking about getting that information. And I think genetic counselors tend to handle that right now in the way that we handle lots of other uncertain information is helping people begin to think about, you really sort of shift into individual behavior change counseling mode of like, what is important to you in terms of your risk for developing cancer 
um, you know, we maybe are a change, maybe we're giving you a slightly increased risk, but what does that actually mean in terms of what you want to do with your life and how that matters to you in terms of your cancer screening, your cancer treatment, wherever you are. Um, so, but I, I agree with you, Vardit, this is, it, it's, um, we, we, we are not seeing this implemented in lots of other places clinically, and we would universally at the moment, it's not ready for prime time elsewhere. And, and it's, um, yeah, questionable in terms of the other piece of that question, Kamisha, um, around sort of the sickle cell example of, of how do you, how do you help? I, I don't know if it was a question around how do you help an individual sort of weigh those, the, the benefits, the potential benefits versus, um, the potential, um, uh, condition risks of a particular variant um, for, on an individual level, or whether we're talking about a population level. I wasn't sure what the question was. My my, my guess would be po would be population level. Um, you know, just interpreting the question. But we are actually out of time. Um, so um, it, I mean, it's clear that this has really this has really enlivened people with a lot of really interesting questions. Some of which. As, as Radit has been consistently reminding us are really at a different scope um, than, um, than what can be sort of handled in thinking about how genetic um, test, genetic counseling can be less ableist and more supportive and, uh, and actually increase autonomy rather than funneling people towards a certain um, socially you know, suggested decisions, to, you know, maybe mandated. Um, so anyway, thank you so much. And I believe we'll have uh, Chris back here for uh, re closing remarks. But thank you so much to all our panelists. So I want to thank uh, our panelists. I want to thank our moderators. I want to thank our audience today. Uh, this has been an incredibly rich discussion, and I want to, uh, particularly from the context of uh, genetics and genomics, ability and disability uh, emerging in existing technologies, uh, I want to underscore that we will continue to have these conversations, and that for all of our audience members, we see all of your questions. We have not been able to answer all of them, but we are working on ways to further engage. We will also be further engaging in a very specific, um, very central way at the same time by having a conference um, on October 6th and 7th on the theme of irreducible subjects, disability and genomics in the past, present and future, in which we will continue to discuss many of the topics brought up here today by our panelists and by our audience. And there is a call for paper uh, for papers as well. And we can put all of that information uh, in the chat about the conference, as well as for the open call for papers and presentations to be one of our featured speakers. And this is a uh, conference on, on disability genetics and genomics that I'm also co-chairing with, with Michael Rembus. So we can have many of uh, the extensions of many of these conversations today then as well. Um, one of the things that I wanted to also talk about is um, you know, just in general, a lot. Of, there's been a lot of discussion about ethics and a lot of discussion about justice uh, in the context of these genetics and genomics discussions. And I want to just be clear that I think it's really important in all of these discussions and in the course of all of these decisions that our ethics is ethical, and that they're all, that these that these decisions are also. Uh, tied to very central notions of justice. And I think one of the things that has been brought up a number of times, and I think correctly by, uh, by Vardit, is to say that what we really need is we need structural changes in, in many aspects of society in order to make uh, disability less stigmatizing and, and, more, and more accessible and acceptable. And I think that's an incredibly powerful notion because at root, uh, we have as our fundamental task to really think about these discussions about autonomy and, and choice, about making a world um, that is more accessible and more acceptable for, for individuals with disabilities. Um, and this is something where I think language is extraordinarily important and intertwined with action, but it is also action. So it's not simply language, but also how language is tied to actions themselves. So, and I would also say too, 
to be even a bit more metaphysical that structural change is important and a really important facet of all our debates, but, but societal society and the structures which uh, inhabit them are also made up of individuals. So this is also carried out on the level of the individual as well. So with, with um, that quandary and with, with that question, I will, I will leave you to, to have a good rest of the day. And thank you again to our panelists and our moderators and our audiences. And I very much uh, thank all of our engagement and for this rich discussion today. Thank you. <laughs>